there were other principles as well. First of all, they had to be accurate. In other words, the, the story, however offbeat, on which the stories in my book were based, had to have actually happened to some engine somewhere, sometime. You remember the story of in Duck and the Diesel, how Duck crashed through a barber's shop. And the barber was quite calm about it. It's only an engine. Well, I got that from a page of offbeat accidents in the Railway Gazette. That actually happened at uh, one of the Hull stations. One of the engines in Edward's shed was called Gordon. He was very big and very proud. You watch me this afternoon, little Edward, he boasted, as I rush through with the express. That'll be a splendid sight for you. My father did have problems with artists who didn't know anything about trains. And they would draw the same engine differently on several different pages. And of course, small children are very quick to pick this up. And they write to the author and point out these mistakes. Well, Audrey was fairly specific about which way he wanted the engines to face. And so you were stuck with having uh, either the back end of an engine with no face on at all, or else some very peculiar view where you could just about see the face. Uh, but generally, it, uh, it was a fairly straightforward process, provided I remembered which way round engines faced on the railway line. I suppose what struck me most about them was the incredible vivid colour. I mean, it seems like a, a rather banal thing to say, but if you think about the 50s, most books were fairly grey, and those books that weren't were printed on a, a kind of rather sort of browny paper, and, and maybe were just two or three colours, and there was something about these tank engine books that they were incredibly vivid, incredibly bright, um, and, and almost kind of glowing. Now, I mean, there's several moments in the, in the Thomas the Tank Engine books that I, I can remember and I've carried with me for all my life. And I suppose one of the key ones um, is the moment when Henry gets bricked up in uh, the very first of the Thomas Tank Engine books, the three railway engines. Now, this has just been handed to me, and I've just seen this for the first time for something like what must be 45 years. And I went, ah, this is incredible, because I've held the picture in my head, I've held the, the picture there, and then suddenly I'm seeing it, and it's an extraordinary thing in which the two things are meeting. It's more real than we could possibly imagine. And it seems to remind us of, of a world that is gone. As you look at those drawings, first drawn by C. Reginald Dalby, you see those green hills and the, the blue distant mountains and the sea beyond, and you see the, the cows strolling through the meadows, and you see the children standing alongside the line, waving at the trains as they go by. That is an evocation of, a, of an age that is gone. And it's always, always created in glowing, iridescent colors. And those colors and those pictures leap off the page at you. Some of the stones hit Henry's boiler and spoilt his paint. One hit the fireman on the head as he was shoveling coal, and others broke the carriage windows. It's a shame, it's a shame, hissed Henry. They've broken our glass, they've broken our glass, sobbed the coaches. I'm, I'm scraping off glue that's um, imposing on the image of the painting so I can clean it off and it's good for reproduction. The, this type of series has got lots of glue damage. Um, some has had some kind of skinning of the surface. Uh, the paper's come off and I've had to replace the paper and paint over it. 
or lots of the paint has popped off from the surface of the picture and I've had to repaint the image. The driver and fireman were drinking cocoa in the brake van. The guard pulled out his watch. The kipper's due, he said. Who cares, said the fireman, this is good cocoa. Boko, my dear engine, he gasped. Save me! Boko quickly sized up the situation and sent Bill and Ben about their business. They were cheeky at first, and Boko threatened to take away the trucks of coal he'd bought for them. That made them behave at once. Gordon thought he was wonderful. Those little demons, he said. How do you do it? Ah, oh, well, said Boko, it's just a knack. Gordon thinks to this day that Boko saved his life, but we know that the twins were only teasing, don't we? Reading the stories nowadays, one does get the impression that, to begin with, say, for the first five books, um, the stories are told on a much... No, not a much younger level, but on a, at, a, at a more young level than they later became. Father developed as a writer, of course, and I think the stories developed with him. He began to use more complicated plots. And then you've got to remember that you're, write, you're not merely writing for children. You're writing for the unfortunate people Fa uh, mothers, fathers, aunts, uncles, grandfathers, grandmothers, who've got to read the children, the, the stories aloud, not just once, but over and over and over again. And so, the story must be easy to read. Henry comes home when it's his birthday. And I said, happy birthday. There's this big hole where all the presents have to go in there. And there's trees. And the, you know these bits on the top of the engines? Well, there's no, um, what is it? I forgot now. Henry um, is t t chosen to take some fish to some place and then he goes really fast and he slips off the line and then he gets and then he had up uh, he had new coal when he was going and he got some old and he got his old coal back but he got a new shape in body. But again and again, the books are returning to the idea of order and who's in charge. And obviously we know, the fat controller, that he's the, he's the big chief. And then we have the engines, and there's a hierarchy between the engines as to who's entitled to pull the express trains, and little Thomas the Tank who thinks that he's a bit better than that. And, and then below that, below the level of the engines, you've got the carriages. The passengers came and argued too, but Henry would not move. The fat director who was on the train told the guard to get a rope. We'll pull you out, he said. Drive up! Why are you late? We've got no train left, I'm afraid that's not good enough. You're very late, you've thrown everything out of Kanka. Oh, very sorry. I'll have to ask you to come and see me afterwards, OK? Who is the driver, anyway? Mr Malcolm. Malcolm? Barry yeah. Malcolm? Oh, well, that explains a lot. Yes. Right. I'd like to see him afterwards. Yes, sir, Mr Control. Good. I was rather annoyed with uh, bureaucrats in high places who issued directives but didn't do, uh, do anything uh, themselves to help implement them. And that's what the fa first, fa first fat director was inclined to do. One, two, three, push, he said, but didn't push himself. My doctor has forbidden me to push, he said.
There is certainly an analogy to be drawn between the fact that uh, the, the engines are governed by a sort of omnipresent uh, being. Um, and if you care to equate the fat controller with God in that sense, then fine. Um, I don't think really that that was the original concept, but Father being a clergyman, maybe it was a subconscious one. Audrey's fed into them, really, the way in which children relate to adults. That's actually what you're talking about. You're talking about children in families and children in schools and the hierarchical world that children belong to and younger children and older children. And Audrey very cleverly has, in a sense, taken those ideas about hierarchy and order and put them on to objects that we used to see around us the whole time. I don't set out to write a moral story. When I, when I was young, we used to, on Sundays, we used to have to read horribly boring moral stories about good little boys and girls who, in our opinion, my brothers and I opinion, wanted kicking rather than... They were so, they were so beastly good. And they were, they, and they were, they were held up as moral examples. Well, my stories are, are nothing like that. The engines are, uh, have, have human characteristics, like children faced with a prohibition. As, as every child does, they push it and push it and push it to see how far they can go without bringing trouble on themselves. And then they do find, they do find it, but in, in, my, in my engines, they may be punished, but they're not scrapped. Uh, they have to express sorrow and intention of amendment and then they brought then they're, they're, they're brought back into the into the family, so to speak. Well, Thomas, so you and your driver have been fishing, but fish doesn't suit you, and we must get them out. So the driver and the fireman fetched rods and nets, and they all took turns at fishing in Thomas's tank, while the fat controller told them how to do it. Is someone called Britt Allcroft came along. She is a businesswoman and her children had loved the railway stories. The books had been going strong for over 35 years and were obviously here to stay. So she had talks with my father about making a TV series of the stories. 